we own and operate. And we're recording. Um, so that's it for me. I have nothing else to contribute to this. I know nothing about cybersecurity. I have a hard enough time getting my AirPods to disconnect from my phone so that I can hear people. So I will turn it over to the folks at 46 Solutions. Eric Devaye. Did I say it? No, not it. Yeah, that was pretty good. <laughs> Thank I you, Kaylin. I appreciate it. I'm Michael Whitney. Thank you guys for hosting. No problem. Thanks for having us. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. Can everyone see the slideshow okay? All right. So thank you for the introduction. My name is Eric Del Valle. I'm the senior camp manager for 46 Solutions. And my co-presenter uh, today is John Michael Whitney, and he is our senior cybersecurity manager. And today we're going to give you a cybersecurity presentation on how to not get scammed. So a lot of times businesses are falling for really common scams these days, and we're going to talk to you about some stories that your business could be falling for and how we can help. So on today's agenda, we're going to go over some common stories of human error, what your employees can fall for, and share what kind of hacks they use, what these hackers use, and ultimately how to keep your company safe. John Michael, you want to go over some questions we should be asking every business owner out there? Yeah, so this is a good starting point for anybody that is interested in uh, assessing your situation. Uh, ask yourself or your IT people, your managed service provider, whoever that is, what is our disaster recovery plan? Assuming that the worst case scenario happens, uh, what are we going to do about it? Uh, the next question there is, when was our last security risk assessment? This is the process by which you determine where your gaps are and what you can do to um, more efficiently handle any kind of incident, disasters, et cetera. The third one there, we've got how, how much data would we lose if ransomware encrypted all of our systems at 3 p.m. tomorrow? So I, I like this question because it makes you think about a very specific circumstance. How much data would we lose? Um, you know, when was the last backup we have and how long would it take to restore? What would our business you know, look like during that time? Would we be sending people home? Uh, would we be able to accomplish our goals, et cetera? And then the last one there is, um, if you're using a managed service provider, ask them when was the last time they had an independent security audit? Uh, when was the, the last time they were assessed for their security? It's gonna help show you how committed they are and how capable they're gonna be of, of assisting yeah. your business. I don't know how that works, but can you run a double overtime? So no double overtime. Never. Looks like yeah, someone is time. still no, so unmuted. Yeah. Like Make sure everybody is and muted, okay? And one of you is not. And then what happened was they put time out, the Raiders ran the ball, got the first down, and, and got the field goal. Our next presentation is going to be about how to mute on Zoom yeah, calls. It, it won't help. I'm, I'm still <laughs> terrible with <laughs> Zoom. Liz, can you mute them as the host? But I'm trying to find the person. And then the Raiders <laughs> got the first down, and then the field goal to win. I'm not going to say who that was. Okay. Okay, well, I think we were just finished with this slide right, right at that point. Yeah, so the last thing I want to add to John Michael's questions is a lot of businesses tend to say, well, you know, everything that we utilize is on the cloud. Well, even if it's on the cloud, you should be auditing the services that you use. Are they auditing themselves? Do they have backups of your data that you trust them with? Yeah, that introduces the vendor management program, which is part of every good security um, program and assessment, uh, determining what your vendors are doing with your data and how they're going to handle it in, in the worst case scenario as well. Like even Microsoft, big vendors like that. Exactly. And using these questions, just think about what's the worst that can happen uh, to your small business. And of course, you see a ransomware attack where your personal files are encrypted. Well, Unfortunately, there was a small business in Kentucky that was a victim of this ransomware attack where you had a small eight person shop with eight computers, eight PCs. Uh, they were a victim of a ransomware attack and it started out with this local business owner in central Kentucky got a message at 1030 in the evening on Saturday while he's sipping on some bourbon and he's got a message saying, hey, I think we're under attack. Got an email saying, hey, you've been compromised, you've been locked out. Well, sure enough. He checked his systems and he was locked out. Uh, their entire business was locked out. They had a managed IT provider that they were using already. So they engaged them. They also engaged some specialists in negotiating with the, with the 
uh, customer and the, the hacker themselves. And one of the funny things that they told them in the middle of the story was, you're lucky that you were a victim of this ransomware group because essentially this group, are they're one of the few groups that will give you your data back after you pay the ransom, where there's a lot of hacker groups that even if you pay them in cryptocurrency, they won't give it back. They'll just leave your stuff completely locked out. So now you're responsible for trying to get back on business. So initially they started out with $700,000 and a ransom, and then they were able to negotiate it down to $150,000. And at the end of the day, they called that a win because they got their systems back, but we rewarded a hacker for successfully locking up this business. And one thing that this business owner, you know, was talking about in this video on Tech Republic was the fact that they never thought that a small shop like them with eight people would be a victim, would be selected by, uh, by a hacker group. And these hacker groups throw wide nets and get the easy prey. Um, and unfortunately, they were one of the victims. And they realized quickly, even though they're a cabinetry company, you would think that, hey, they can continue making cabinets. Well, because all their computers were locked up, all those computers are what made the machinery in their warehouses work. So they couldn't continue their business. They were shut down for days. So at the end of this, they were able to unlock their systems by paying the ransom. And the end of, at the end of that, the hacker set, uh, sent them a message saying, hey, uh, if you want help on preventing this from happening to you again, feel free to contact this number and we'll help you out. So ransomware is something that affects all businesses. The bad guys, like Eric said, they're casting a wide net. They're going to catch more small and medium businesses than they are the large businesses just by nature of the volume of business. This scenario um, strikes me when he talks about his heart sinking because I think we've all been in a situation that was out of our control where we got that pit in our stomach and what are we going to do? And it's 1030 at night on a Saturday night. This is like the last thing you want to hear about. And this is kind of goes back to what we're talking about. If you've asked those four questions, you know what your plan is. You've got a documented disaster recovery plan. You've got an incident response plan. It's not just you that's reacting in this scenario. You've got your staff on board already because everybody knows what to do. There's some phone calls that you're going to need to make. The incident response um, a company that Eric was mentioning that did the negotiation with the um, the bad guys to for to get the ransom down. That's something that a lot of businesses are out there doing right now, and it would be worth your time to establish like who which one of those you know do some research now so that at 10:30 on a Saturday night you know what you're going to do. At least at that point, you're you're being efficient in your response because you're you're not responding and reacting as much as you have a plan. Exactly. And have that contact saved because at the end of the day, you never know when you might be a victim because you always want to work on the assumption that, hey, I may be I may be a target one day. And that's because we have a lot of data floating out there in the dark web. So this slide talks about this dark web that we hear about all the time. So picture the iceberg. Everything above the waterline is the surface web. That's where we are all the time. That's where we're um, doing our social media. We're buying things et cetera, all of our personal activities. And then the deep web is gonna be where companies are transacting um, all of their business. So this is gonna be the inside network for your business, for example, where you're sharing information with your staff. And then of course the dark web, we hear about all the time, that's that's down there a little bit harder to get to. Uh, you gotta have a special browser to, to go there. And that's where the bad guys are trading information. We hear about the breaches constantly. I mean, Equifax was breached. All of my information, all of your information was part of that breach. And then they found that information being sold um, by the original original bad guys that got it over and over and over again. It's been sold and traded so many times. So that's how they're getting some information about us. And then they're using those passwords to try to compromise all of our other accounts. Exactly. Well said. And just think of eBay or dark web as the eBay for bad guys. And one thing I want to focus on is on the top of the iceberg, you see Facebook and Google. Well, social media plays a key part in this. I know a lot of people think that hackers are just, you know, 25 year old men in their mom's basement just hacking away. Uh, well, they're not. They're looking for that easy, easy prey, easy way to uh, compromise people's businesses. And one of those easy ways is using, using social media and using tactics like social engineering. 
Yeah, so social engineering is where the bad guy is going to discover information um, just out there from your social media, for example. So here's a scenario where we have Crystal, our marketing manager, who does an excellent job of promoting our events across all sorts of different platforms. And her Bob, her, her Bob, her boss, Bob Frank, um, the bad guy knows that because he's built an org chart of our of our entire organization from LinkedIn, right? So he then knows that the bad guy knows that he can send Crystal an email message that's talking about this upcoming event. So there's some context there. And what he wants to do is have a giveaway of some gift cards. And I'm sure you've all heard about the gift card scam. Um, we know people who have, who have fallen for it. And so there's some context enough so that it looks like something Crystal might expect to see, even though it's not something that's happened before. So in this case, we've got some email addresses there that look pretty much exactly the same. The bad guy took the effort to uh, buy a domain very similar to 46 Solutions in this case and um, was able to you know, send that message so that the Crystal might not notice that it was from Bob. And again, this is a fictional scenario, but it, it plays out just like things we've seen um, in real life. Exactly. And, you, and that just goes to show you that you should be careful as, as far as what, you, what you're posting on social media online, because ultimately it's a public space and everyone can see it. And sometimes you just shouldn't post it. Here's this other example that we have that was pretty surprising when we found out about it. The um, emergency management system in Hawaii, I'm sure you all recall, I think it was a few years ago when they sent out a a text message and an email to all of the citizens of the state of Hawaii warning of this impending missile attack from North Korea. The whole system was compromised and we'll see here that it wasn't some, like Eric was mentioning earlier, some really smart hacker uh, pounding away on his keyboard. It was social engineering. In this case, there's the password for the system uh, taped with a post-it note to the monitor there. The um, person who posted it, presumably this, this emergency management person is wearing his badge even. There's a whole lot of information here that a, a social engineer um, could use to get a foothold, get some compromise um, going with this environment. Really, the real issue is that we have a doppelganger of Crystal in Hawaii who's just doing such an excellent job <laughs> posting on social media that causing all sorts of compromises. So there's a few things that you can do here to combat this type of thing. And it starts with that documentation, having a plan or having, having documentation about what you expect uh, from your people in terms of a social media policy, uh, acceptable use policy, that sort of thing. And then here we have, you know, part of that is personally identifiable information and health information that might be posted from a badge or from documents that are found in the office. If you're taking photographs and posting them online, uh, we have workers comp claim is one of those things that we see in those pictures a lot. And one of the things you can do with regards to penetration testing is physical penetration testing, where you have an outside uh, company like ours come in and uh, see if we can get into your office and walk around. And, and if we did that, what would we see? What would we be able to gain access to? You'll be amazed at how often you can get into any building with a hard hat and yellow vest. That's, that's one of our most successful techniques. Yep. Uh, so now, if Forrest Gump was going to be made today, this year in 2022, he would say something like, passwords are like underpants. So you shouldn't share them with others. Don't leave them out for everyone to see and change them regularly. And ultimately, what this boils down to is, uh, I know everyone's thinking, well, I already have to memorize so many passwords. I have a few key things that I change on the end of the password. Maybe I add an exclamation point and the next one, I, next time I use it, I use a question mark or I change the number from one to two. And I, I know we're, we can all be guilty of this, but there's something out there that we can all utilize to help us make our lives easier in, in terms of using passwords and using strong passwords. And that's something called a password manager. So, all, with a password manager, all you have to do is remember one strong password to access your password vault. And the password manager essentially creates strong passwords for all your websites, remembers them for you, and fills them all in. And the great thing about it is you only have to remember one. You don't have to remember which number to change at the end or which character to change at the end. And you can use it on your computers, your Windows, Macs, iPhones, iPads, Androids all those platforms and it's super easy to use and very affordable, sometimes even free.
a couple of key things to consider along with that is that post-it note we saw had a password written on it. I'm sure we're all familiar with that. We've all seen a password written down on a desk somewhere. It's because they're hard to remember. Password manager helps you with that. And then also a password manager um, can work with multi-factor authentication. So that's one of the mitigating options you have around passwords. Password discipline, where you are using a different password for every website. Um, the password is complex and that doesn't mean it meets complexity requirements because there's plenty of passwords that meet those requirements that are also not safe because the bad guys are going to try them. Like for instance, winter 2021 with an exclamation point meets a lot of password um, complexity requirements of systems, but it's an easy one that's that's in all the dictionaries we use when we're trying to crack a password. And so the other the other thing is this MFA, the multi-factor authentication, and that's the thing that you have. So the password is something that you know, and the multi-factor authentication is something that you have. And it can be a token that's on your phone or a text message that's sent, but it's the thing that the bad guy's not going to have, even when he gets your credentials, whether by guessing them or by getting them on the dark web. Well said, John, John Michael. And one of the other items that we should be protecting out there are our mobile devices and how they play a pivotal role in your business. Because a lot of times we're using these mobile devices to access confidential data for your business, whether it's your email or documents on your phone or your iPad. And a lot of times we only think about, business owners only think about protecting their computers, but why not their mobile devices? They're always using them. A lot of times we're using them more than we're using our computers themselves because we're always running around on appointments, going from one meeting to the next, and maybe we don't have time to sit down in front of our desktop computers or laptops. And one of the ways you can protect yourselves are just using a mobile device management. So essentially, this is a program that you can implement into your workforce, whether you give your employees uh, phones or you have a bring your own device program where they bring their own device, but you allow them to access your work email. Uh, mobile device management is a software program that allows you to lock, uh, remotely lock the phone and locate it as well as wipe it. So if it is lost or stolen, uh, you can lock it, locate it, or, you know, if it's not salvageable, you can just erase it to ensure that, you know, that criminal, or even if it's lost, they don't get access to any of your personal uh, confidential data uh, regarding your business. And just speaking of mobile devices uh, for a little bit too, uh, I'm sure, I know, I don't see everyone's faces on here, but I'm sure everyone has gotten a, a few spam text messages, a little phishing text messages over the last few weeks. And I for sure have gotten one. I've gotten recently about Amazon saying, click here to claim my missing package. Because uh, I'm one of those people who orders something, you know, on a regular basis about once a month or so from Amazon. Well, you know, those are phishing techniques that are expanding outside of your computers to your mobile devices because the criminals are, they know that, hey, this is easy prey because cell phones nine times out of 10 are not protected. And you're running around, you may not, you may quickly, you know, look at that message, say, oh, I forgot, I did order something. And they're hoping to click that. And once again, they're, ca they're casting that wide net, right, John Michael? Yeah, absolutely. Those those phishing messages that come through texts, those um, text messages, like I think they're called smishing, are uh, they're they're so incredibly effective because at first we weren't even really thinking in terms of text messages having those bad links in them, but then they also have to do with you know a bank that I use, I was told my password needed to be reset. I mean, we all have packages coming all the time. They're telling us that our package is gonna be delayed or click this, they're, they're very compelling um, things. So again, social um, awareness, um, security awareness training helps you think about these types of scams um, and, and, and hopefully think twice before you click something that you weren't expecting. Exactly. And John Michael, what do these all have in common? Us, most of these things are related to humans. Uh, we are fallible. Um, every, each and every one of us um, makes mistakes, and we're that that attack vector that we can't seem to totally account for in IT security. So I guess antivirus won't be enough, right? <laughs> it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> so like John Michael said, we're the common uh, link to all these uh, scams. And there's accidental and preventable. Now the accidental, people make mistakes. Like John Michael said, people are fallible. Uh, we're, we're not perfect. And a lot of this is due to the fact that companies don't, they have a lack of cybersecurity awareness training. 
um, there's no training in place to prevent these issues, these mistakes. Yep, having documented policies and procedures so that your staff understands what your expectations are and that you have plans in place to accommodate for the worst case scenario. Having that cybersecurity awareness training program, a good program will send a message out weekly about something that's going on that's like in the current world in terms of the types of scams that are going on. They're real short, so they don't take up a lot of time, but they can't kind of keep security at top of mind. And then also the phishing simulation, when we send out a test phishing message, that's how we're determining the effectiveness of that cybersecurity awareness training program. Are people clicking those phishing messages less since we started sending out the awareness training? Yeah, maybe we send a phishing email impersonating Bob and send it to Crystal asking, hey, we just had a ribbon cutting at Studio 46 at our sister company, and I have $500 in gift cards I want to give away as prizes. And Crystal just, you know, she clicks on that link, right? Uh, she doesn't. That's all fictional. But uh, those are what phishing simulations could look like. And some of the ways that you can implement cybersecurity in your business is following these steps. And step number one, provide training to your staff. Uh, you know, you know what happens when you assume. Don't assume your team knows what to look for because they don't. Yeah, and then test um, regularly your team's ability to identify scams um, through the phishing testing, through penetration testing, all that, that, that sort of thing. Yep, and STEM3, I know some of this looks kind of like review, but maintain strong passwords. Uh, you know, use strong passwords, use multi-factor authentication, uh, to protect yourself, because even if you're, you know, use a very strong password and, you know, got compromised through the, into the dark web and someone has it, even with MFA, they're still not able to get into account. That adds an extra layer of protection, uh, so that way they, the hackers don't have access to your data. These big ransomware attacks that we're hearing about, going back to the pipeline last year and the meat packing and. Um, you know, we hear about them because they're huge and they affect all of us in some cases. But we always think about, like, from a cybersecurity perspective, you know, there must have been some really complex, you know, again, a hacker pounding away on a keyboard, breaking into systems. These, these ones that we've heard about, these main high-profile high ones, they were all related to passwords, bad, bad password discipline. In some cases, a password that hadn't been changed in several years, um, a password that didn't, you know, that, that was easy to guess, or if it's not been changed in several years, it doesn't even have to be easy to guess. But multi-factor authentication is something that we're seeing as a requirement now in a lot of, not just for compliance environments or regulatory environments, but also insurance companies uh, doing cybersecurity renewals over the last six months or so have started um, requiring it. And, and that's because they're the ones that have been paying out for these huge ransoms. They realize um, that this is an effective um, mitigation is uh, that multi-factor authentication. And there are many customers out there, many businesses that are requiring the, the business partners that they, they work with like vendors, uh, they won't work with them unless they have multi-factor authentication implemented in their business because they're also being victims of phishing emails. So it's, it's becoming a requirement, even in an unregulated uh, area uh, in businesses out there. Anywhere where we have to have trust with each other and sharing that information. Uh, don't leave your staff in the dark. Um, implement these um, policies and procedures we've been talking about so that your staff knows. Um, don't, don't assume that they know what you want them to do. Make sure everybody's on the same page, literally. Yeah, and last, last step, step number five, know your vulnerabilities, know your weaknesses. At the end of the day, um, work on the assumption that you may be a target and have, have a third party audit, whether it's you know on your business, if you have internal IT, or if you have a third party IT, um, have them audited. Because at the end of the day, John Michael, if we were to grade ourselves, or if anyone was to grade ourselves, we're gonna give each other an A plus, right? Yeah, it's easy to, to think that you know it all, but, you know, there's all sorts of stuff that we know that we don't know. And that's where the security risk assessment that looks at your posture in terms of what you're doing right now, and then it's tested with vulnerability scanning, it's tested with a penetration test, uh, you know, a hacker tries to break into your systems, that physical penetration test where we have a qualified individual, um, you know, try to, try to walk around in your secure areas of your facility, that sort of thing. With those sorts of test results and the reporting that we can produce from that, it helps you efficiently apply your resources towards, you know, mitigating the, the biggest gaps. Um, and, and that's 
something that everybody ought to be doing. Well said. And right here, you just heard all of our stories that we've given you all examples of um, what common at of ransomware attacks or just common hacks that you see we see every single day um, as a managed IT company. And these are all services that we offer in all of our managed service plans. And if you'll notice, the first thing you see on there is security awareness training platform. Because at the end of the day, all these tools help. They're great. They help mitigate risk and they help mitigate human error. But at the end of the day, we really can't fully prevent human error. We can't stop Crystal from clicking on that link and buying $500 on Apple gift cards uh, because Bob asked her to. Yeah, we all want to do the right thing. And when our boss asks us to do it, you know, oftentimes we, we, we want to do it, right? And that's, that's how we end up falling for those types of things. The dark web uh, breach monitoring um, should be part of that just to alert us to things that we know are out there. We assume that there's a lot more out there, but um, it's good to know at least when those credentials, when your credentials show up for sale somewhere. And then the fish testing that provides you the metrics about how effective those uh, training platforms are. Uh, that fourth one there is that Microsoft and third-party patch management. These, again, are things that the vendors know about. They've, they've developed patches to solve a vulnerability. If you haven't applied that patch efficiently in a timely manner, you know, you're subject to that same vulnerability. That's Most often, they're, they're, they know about them because they're being compromised in the wild. They're, they're legitimate things to worry about, even though uh, it's not as it's not as fun to talk about patch management as some of the other <laughs> stuff, right? Yeah, right, but that's but, low hanging fruit. You know, that's what the hackers do. They cast that wide net, see who hasn't updated, who pushed that annoying Windows update, right? Yeah. Who pushed it off because they didn't want to restart the computer. Yep. Every business, you know, every, every business that has an internet connection is under attack constantly, whether you see it or not, and it's it's scanning for things like that. This whole security stack we've developed and we evolve over time as the threats change because they change pretty regularly. We're seeing new new attack vectors, but this, this is sort of a living thing. These are the things that we require um, and we then therefore provide um, for all of our customers because it's the stuff that we need to have in place just, just so we can sleep at night, right? These are, these are the things we know we have to be doing. That security information and event management platform, um, this is the thing that gathers information, log data from all of your network endpoints, your computers, your phones, your switches, your firewall. And it looks for interesting things that might be something that we need to investigate, like a login from a foreign country, that, uh, for example. Um, the Security Operations Center, that's who's looking at that information and responding in a timely manner if we need to lock out an account or, or block a computer while we, while we complete an investigation. Uh, Eric, you mentioned the antivirus, anti-malware earlier. Uh, 25 years ago, this is what this is what we had. We there weren't as many vulnerabilities out there because there weren't as many systems out there. And um, when we identified one, the the antivirus program, you know, set up a mitigation for it. And it was all reactionary, but it it was okay. It was it was the best we could do back then. Modern days, um, application control is something that. Um, we have in place. This is kind of the newest addition to, to our security stack. And what it allows us to do is take a, um, an assessment of all of the programs that you want running across your entire enterprise. And, um, and then anything else that runs requires some approval. So when the bad guy goes to run his tool that doesn't meet that requirement, we, we haven't seen it before, it doesn't just get to run. It requires us to say, um, you know, approve that and, and, that, that, and then we can identify that that's not something we want running. And then the uh, next three we have here, the web filter, the email filter, and the fish detection, they are more like the antivirus. They're preventing us from clicking the things that we know are bad. So that we've got a company that gathers all this information about bad websites and bad IP addresses, and it keeps us from, from falling for those um, when we're browsing the internet, or if they pop up in an advertisement, which is the most often um, case, we, we can't control that, but those tools can block that. Email filters the same way. If there's a bad attachment or a link that's taking you to a bad place, it'll prevent that. And then the advanced AI fish detection is something that's fairly new. It, it, it's come out over the last couple of years. It's very good. The tool we use is about 95% effective at grabbing those targeted phishing messages from that look like they're from Bob to Crystal before Crystal can click on it. And so, you know, 95%, that's a pretty good number. Um, that 5% is still, you know, <laughs> enough to worry about that we fall back on the security awareness training platform constantly as our, you know, you gotta have this in place. And then finally, that firewall monitoring, 
businesses ought to have firewalls um, because all the data that's coming from that firewall is all the traffic that's in and out of your network. And so that's going to tell us if you're connecting to a place that shouldn't be connected to um, or if a lot of data is being exfiltrated from your network. And that monitoring data goes right back to that SIM, that security information and event management platform to identify um, and help the security operations center guys um, see if there's anything that needs to be looked at further. And just to add on to John Michael's point, uh, when he spoke about application control and that being our newest tool that we added, we're constantly evolving because the bad guys are cost constantly evolving. So we have to keep up with them to make sure that your businesses out there are protected. And I know we went over a lot of information on that last slide. So I'd love to set up you know, the next one because we're done with our presentation. If you have any questions about what we spoke about, um, we'll drop our contact information to email and our phone number. So if you have any questions that you would also like to take offline or set up a meeting, feel free to contact us and we'd love to help you out. Anyone have any questions? Um, there's one in the chat. How do you feel about using public Wi-Fi? That's a, that's a good one, and it's common because we're all using it all the time. There's vulnerabilities with using public Wi-Fi. Um, there's all sorts of, um, you know, your data could be intercepted um, when you're connecting to some, you don't, you don't know who's providing it and what kind of security they have. So for sure, when you're using a public Wi-Fi, you want to be using a VPN as well. Um, and so um, your firewall um, often is that provider of that VPN service so that when you're connected back to your company resources, all of your data is through an encrypted tunnel. So even if you're on an insecure network, the bad guys know that you've connected to a VPN and where that VPN is, but they don't know what you're talking about in the, in the tunnel. They can't see the data. Yep. Moral of the story, don't use the Wi-Fi, Starbucks, or the airport. Or, or if you have to, use a VPN. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have a question. Um, this is Sheila Carmack. Uh, my husband used a manager, a password manager that wasn't then supported by Apple when Apple had, you know, their upgrade or whatever, and he lost all of his passwords. Mm. So, have um, do you guys have like a password manager suggestions? I can tell you what we use. Um, we use LastPass um, Enterprise uh, here at the business, and it's just. Um, a version of LastPass that allows us to have multiple accounts and manage them um, pretty efficiently as a, as a company with all the accounts that we have. Uh, LastPass is, is good because they don't have access to your passwords. You know, they keep your passwords there at their data center. That's where you're accessing them, but they're all encrypted with tokens so that they don't know what your passwords are. If, in fact, if you lose your master password to log into LastPass, you, you pretty much lost all your passwords. So it's important to know what that is. But you only have to remember that one password, like Eric mentioned, with the password manager. And if you put multi-factor authentication on it, you know, even if some bad guy got your master password, he wouldn't be able to log in. Um, you know, none of these solutions are perfect, but we know for sure that, that password discipline is a huge problem. That's where most of these compromises are happening. If a password's not changed frequently, or if it's not complex, or if it's reused from site to site, those are the things that are taken advantage of in, in all of the big stories we hear about. Did that, did that answer the... your question? Here's another one. What are the different multi-factor authentication tools? Oh, so yeah, what, what we're using for MFA. So a lot of the providers have their own um, MFA um, services that you can use with your phone um, and like the Google Authenticator application or the Microsoft Authenticator application, work with those services so that you just open the app and you see a token, something that changes every 30 seconds or so. Um, and it's six digits. And so that's what you're going to put in for your second factor, that multi-factor. Uh, a lot of the services send text messages. And I'm sure, you know, some people have heard that that's not the most secure thing because um, a bad guy can spoof your SIM and then get that same text message. And, and that's true. Um, that would be a very targeted attack. You know, if you if you suspect that that's the kind of thing happening because of your job, then that's definitely something you want to avoid. But I think for the for the most of us, it's it's going to be pretty rare 
that we fall or that we become victim to something like that. So yeah, LastPass, um, the, the Google Authenticator app, the um, Microsoft. Microsoft Authenticator app, uh, Duo is a service that offers um, MFA. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of options out there that are not very expensive if 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 they have any cost at all. Dale asks if his laptop hard drive is safe. So the question there would be if it's encrypted or not. Uh, Microsoft offers encryption. Apple offers encryption um, at the operating system level, so that you can make it so that if your drive uh, falls into the wrong hands. Uh, if, if, if the bad guy wouldn't be able to access the data on it. So encryption is definitely a requirement for anybody with mobile devices, I, I'd say these days. Um, and, and that's sort of the standard operating procedure uh, we apply for ourselves and for, for all of our customers. And one caveat, it must not be home edition. It has to be uh, business. The Microsoft operating system, yeah, it needs to be the pro version to, to be able to do um, bit lockers, what Microsoft calls it. What about using um, personal email addresses for work related? If you're a smaller business and you don't have sure. that. Sure. Yeah, we've run into that before. Um, th there's some issues there because you don't have the ability to do all, most of these tools that we've talked about that have to do with email in terms of security. You can't do if people aren't in your domain's email, if you're not using the same email service, for example. So I would say that that beyond, you know, the reputational risks, et cetera, of not having um, your own mail server um, and allowing people to use like Gmail or Apple mail or whatever, um, I'd say it would be the security risks. We, we can't um, ensure that multi-factor authentication is a requirement to log into it. We can't ensure that the mail is being filtered so that those bad links aren't getting through and we're not pulling out 95% of those um, targeted uh, spear phishing messages. There's, there's enough, um, it, it, it's not as big a cost as it used to be for sure, right? 25 years ago, antivirus was good enough and a mail server cost, you know, $40,000. <laughs> These days, a mail server costs a few bucks a month, right? So, and Microsoft is providing um, excellent services just like they always have around mail. Exactly. And I think a common uh, occurrence in this field is uh, real estate. Unfortunately, I see a lot of real estate agents using personal emails to send confidential data like social security numbers when they're trying to close on a client's house. That's a good point, Eric. And you know, the, the corporate mail systems like Microsoft's uh, 365 service, when you, when you have all of your employees in there, you can implement rules that prevent that kind of thing from happening. Like if, if I accidentally tried to send a social security number over email, it would either automatically encrypt the message or not allow it to go. Just bounce right back to me saying, Hey, you shouldn't be doing that. You know that. So those, those types of things you can't really do with, um, you know, personal email accounts either. Um, we said that antivirus was not enough anymore. So how do you know when something is not enough anymore? Mm. Well, just, I mean, like just to reiterate, reiterate, I guess, on what John Michael said earlier um, in regards to antivirus. Antivirus was good enough back then because, you know, the, and the internet was brand new still, right? And antivirus is more reactive and that's all it is. Antivirus is essentially protecting you for what known threats out there. Um, but unfortunately, there are many unknown threats out there. And some of the antivirus companies are offering more these days than just antivirus. So we, we incorporate the system um, information and event management platform along with the security operations center. Um, whereas like Sophos, for example, has um, a managed threat response team. It's, it's similar. Um, I've evaluated both and I think that our, our way is better at this time, but there are antivirus software vendors of old that now have products that do more than just antivirus and malware, but antivirus and malware still need to be there because that's, you know, let's not get rid of anything um, just because we're adding some enhancements onto it. And like, I guess, like to more fully answer that question, um, we're learning all the time. You know, the, the threat landscape is changing constantly. That's why that security stack is changing as well. We're adding things to it as necessary and, and augmenting the things that are there um, because we don't, you know, 
we know for sure that antivirus isn't enough anymore, but um, there are still plenty, plenty for us to learn along the way. Do we know of any products out there that we can use to protect a home PC? Yeah, so there you want to have for sure your your antivirus product. I mean, at, at, at a base level, um, and the modern ones that are um, updating their definitions constantly, rather than like just once a day, for example, you can get um, home versions of antivirus that have some sort of hotline. Um, you can you can engage some support. Um, that security awareness training that we're talking about, you know, there's a component of that about what you do when you when you think you have a compromise on your computer, um, so that you know how to react. Uh, the home routers um, these days they are not a firewall like we talked about, um, but they do offer um, you know some protection um, in terms of bad guys getting into your systems. So you definitely want to make sure you've got one configured um, in a secure fashion like that. Um, some some home routers also have some web filters that you can put in place too, correct? Yeah, exactly. They're they're not as tunable or customizable as, as we'd like, um, but you can. Um, well, and they're not. None of the web filters are are one hundred percent effective, right? But it, especially if I've got kids in my home, um, I want to be content filtering um, some of that stuff out for sure. And then, you know, getting again, falling back to security awareness training. You know, at home, um, know where not to go. Um, you know, know know what looks fishy and don't click those links. Um, most of the ad content you see in your browser, whether you're on a respected website or not, is suspect in my opinion. Um, so be careful what you click. And I think it's important because you mentioned sec uh, security awareness training. You should take that at home. You should have that discussion with your kids. Teach them what to look for. You know, make them aware. Give them the knowledge because ultimately they don't know what they don't know. So it, what you learn in your business, you should be taking to your home and teaching them to, you know, watch out for. That, that's definitely a whole nother webinar for sure that, that we ought to think about doing, you know, preparing your kids uh, for what to do in an ever changing landscape, right? If your purse, oh, sorry, there was one before that. Um, will LifeLock protect my computers? I don't know if LifeLock does anything to protect your computers. Um, I'm not really familiar with the service. I know that there are a lot of services out there right now that are for identity uh, protection. Um, they monitor your credit, for example. That's like the first place if your identity is getting stolen where, where activity might show up. Um, and I think that's what LifeLock does. I don't know if they have um, anything that protects your computers specifically. It's more of a uh, protecting your identity, I think. This is a good one. If your personal information is compromised, who should you alert? What do you do? Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I get it. So definitely um, you want to have a plan for this, right? And you want to have it written down so that when it happens, you respond efficiently and effectively in a timely fashion. So you want to definitely um, get rid of all your credit cards, make sure that your banks and everybody knows that has any aspect of your finances um, that you've been compromised. Um, the FTC has a website dedicated to this. Um, I don't know how effective they are. Um, I, I've heard of a lot of people submitting reports that, that don't seem like they get any traction. But, um, you know, one of the key elements is to think about, you know, how, how much have you done to protect yourself in this scenario? And even if it's not something you expect to get a response from immediately, if that's what the government is saying you should do, I highly recommend doing that. So let, let the banks know, uh, let, let your people know, and um, let the government know. Well, that's all the questions I have in the chat right now. Anybody else have any questions? All right. Well, well thank, thank you for your time. And a show, yes, thank, thank you guys you. for joining us so much. And thanks again for Kalen and Lexington Event Company for sponsoring and for 46 Solutions for coming on and spending their time with us today. We really appreciate it. It was some great information. So I did put into the chat Eric and John Michael's contact information. Um, I also put a link uh, to that 
um, ransomware article. It is a video. It's pretty short. It's like 10 minutes or something. Um, super interesting because it did happen right here in Kentucky. Um, and then I, there's also a link in here on uh, combating text message scams um, that's over on LinkedIn. It actually will go through how you can put personal settings on your Android or iPhone device to um, help alleviate some of those scam messages. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it and uh, hope to see you guys out there. Thanks so much.